Hey parents, we know that you value the freedoms we enjoy as Americans, that you want your children to learn about and cherish these freedoms, right? But chances are, your children aren't learning about the principles of freedom. You see, there aren't any textbooks that teach about these principles. You won't learn about them in public schools. Three years ago, our dad was in your shoes. He's a very patriotic guy. He wanted to teach us about the principles of freedom. So he went on Amazon and began searching for kids' books. And he found nothing! That's right. There are precisely zero books that teach about the principles of freedom. So he teamed up with a buddy of his to create... The Title Twins! This book series teaches young kids like us about the principles of freedom. There's nothing else like it. Each of the books covers a different aspect of freedom. The proper role of government, individual liberty, free markets, property rights, sound money, and more. We read it over and over and over again. These books have been a huge hit, and thousands of parents just like you have been able to help their children learn about the principles of freedom in a really fun way. Don't forget about the free workbooks. Oh, that's right. Our dad says he's so convinced your kids will love these books that he wants to sweeten the deal a little. Every book has a 20-page activity workbook that goes with it. And when you buy the books, he's going to give you all the workbooks for free! So click here to check out the books so you can give your children a foundation of freedom. What are you waiting for? Maybe I said it wrong? Do it for your children! Click, click! You will click the button. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows use or modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Fanaticism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on TheSeedsOfLiberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So peace wanakism is covered by the BIPCOT no-gov license. This allows for use by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today I'm delighted to have returning Connor Boyack coming in from Utah. He heads up the Libertas Institute over there, and he's a libertarian voluntarist, and he's the author of Freedom and passion-driven education, but uh, today we're going to talk about um, the the next two installments. Uh, one he recently published called "The Tuttle Twins and the Road to Serfdom," and which is about eminent domain and central planning, and then um, the Tuttle Twins and the Golden Rule, which will be released uh, in a little bit. But by the time this is published, it will have been released already. <laughs> and that one's about the uh, the non-aggression principle. And and mm -hmm. by the way, this, this these are a series of books. Uh, Tuttle Twins series all about various concepts and principles based on libertarianism, volunteerism, economics, uh, fun stuff like that. So, um, so Connor, thanks a lot for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me. It's always great to chat with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about your your book. So, so is it getting more popular now? Now that you've been releasing, like you, you, you're getting a, uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like every time we release a new book, it kind of bumps the sales of the last one, you know, because uh, we're reaching new people who, who, I mean, we obviously reach the people who already have the existing books and we say, you know, hey, here's the new one. Right. But then the marketing from that new book reaches people who haven't got them. So then they get the whole set. So like every book we put out just kind of expands the the universe. So it's working great. Can you just give a quick background about you, about yourself for people maybe who haven't uh, or weren't familiar with you and then we'll get into yeah. the books. Yeah. So uh, I live in Utah. I'm from San Diego originally. Um, I head up a think tank, a libertarian think tank in Utah called Libertas Institute. And so we work on policies in our state. There's many other state-based think tanks. They're maybe a little bit more conservative or free market and, and not strictly libertarian per se. Uh, we're very successful. We're probably among the most successful state-based think tanks. 77% of our 
proposals are successfully enacted into law. And this is substantive stuff with property rights and family law and government transparency, civil liberties and all sorts of stuff. So that's kind of the day job is working on policy here in our state. But then apart from that, we also do a lot of public education. And obviously the principles of liberty are not just for Utahns, right? Like it's right. for right. everybody. And so <laughs> write a lot of books and produce a lot of videos and things that are, are um, that we kind of export and spread widely far beyond uh, the borders of our state. Um, and so things like the Tuttle Twins is an effort to fill the, the void. I mean, especially in that case, I'm the father of two young children. And a few years ago, I was looking on Amazon trying to find books that would teach, you know, my kids about property rights and free markets. And there really wasn't anything. And uh, and so we decided to to create it. And so Tuttle Twins now, yeah, with the Golden Rule book, now that's uh, six books. And uh, we're going to do 10 in the series. And um, we're translating them into a bunch of languages, sending them all over the world. Like it's been a, a huge success lately. So it's definitely filling a void that hmm. that has gone unfulfilled until now. Wow, that's awesome. Really great. And also there's another uh, project that you're doing uh, uh, regarding teaching uh, using the Total Twins, is it, is it the spontaneous order book and teaching them in the schools? Right? Can you go a little bit about that? Yeah. So so obviously it's one thing to just kind of rely on book sales for individual families. And that is just going to kind of happen organically. And, and that'll take a while to really build that audience. Um, what we're trying to do now is to, to fundraise to get the Miraculous Pencil book. It's the second book in our series based off of excuse me, based off of Leonard Reed's essay, I Pencil. Uh, it teaches all about the free market, division of labor, spontaneous order. And so we're taking that book and we're printing free copies that we provide to students in school and then we give their teachers a lesson plan. And so the beauty there is that this stuff isn't being taught in school at all. So obviously you're supplementing and you're reaching new kids. But the way we structure our program is the book belongs to the kid. It's not like a classroom set that stays there. So we send the book home with the kid and there's a brochure inside for mom and dad to say like, hey, here's the other books in the series. You know, here's a discount code if you want to buy the other ones. Um, and that way they can pick up the additional books in the series. So it's kind of got a little bit of a marketing strategy behind it. <laughs> but really it's a donor-based program so that we can raise money and then do this free market education to this uh, you know age range where it's not being taught at all. And, and really it should be. The kids can understand it and kind of have that foundation that they grow with. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, uh, knowledge of economics um, really helps to dispel many... Um, myths and fears that people might have of capitalism, Definitely. And business, and entrepreneurship um, that might be encouraged in your government uh, <laughs> history class. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. No, it's precisely it, right? Like, why are for too long? The thing that's frustrating running a think tank, or if you're a candidate for office, or you know, someone working to try and persuade others with you know, podcast or other means. Um, it's frustrating because too often we wait until people are adults before we reach them. And by then they've had two decades or more of programming of indoctrination or exposure to certain philosophies. And some of us are fortunate that maybe our parents exposed us to the right thing, or we, you know, came across something on our own or a friend, but the system definitely is, um, in opposition to what we're trying to do where, Hundreds of thousands, millions of children are going through the government schools, and not only are they, they not only are they not being taught this type of material, they're being taught material that's quite in opposition to it. And so, where we're trying to educate adults in everything that we kind of do in the in the liberty orbit, uh, we're not actually educating them. First, we have to de-educate them, you know, as mm. to why central planning is actually not good, or mm -hmm. you know, why collectivism is problematic. Um, you have to de-educate them of these notions that they've hold and, and clung to for years. That's very hard to do. It takes a lot of time, a lot of money. And uh, so what if instead we could plant seeds, right? Mm. Imagine if you had an, an orchard like, and the trees were diseased. Would you just sit there and water the tree in hopes that it suddenly like gets healthy? Well, yeah, maybe you want to still treat the, the tree and save it and, and work with it. 
But why not also focus on planting healthy trees that, you know, have a, a long term positive, healthy growth and development? So that's kind of the idea there is plant seeds for future growth in our movement. We can still work with the, the old trees, the, the sick trees and try and, you know, get the orchard to be a little bit more healthy. But we're also trying to focus on planting seeds that will grow in the future. Awesome. Yeah. It reminds me of the, uh, the quote, uh, Frederick Douglass, it's easier to um so raise strong children than to repair broken men, something like that. <laughs> Interesting. I haven't heard that one before. Oh, it's beautiful. I love it. One of my favorites. Um, I'll have to go look it up. Yes. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll use it for this episode. Um, <laughs> um, so please get into your uh, the recent one, The Road to Serfdom, and what that's about. So this book is um, about, uh, let's see, Hayek's book, F.A. Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom. And uh, he wrote this book decades Aids ago, of course, and his book talks broadly speaking about things like central planning and collectivism and uh, the problems with socialism uh, and that they're antithetical or, or problematic for individuals and freedom and markets. And so uh, the book is is definitely interesting to read. A lot of it is is antiquated now. It doesn't apply as much or it you have to understand kind of the context of of his government and what was happening during that era. So it's a little bit harder to digest for modern readers, but the key elements are important. And the book itself was, was very famous, very popular. Of course, Hayek is a Nobel prize winning economist. Of course, we also have today Nobel peace <laughs> winning prize winning, you know, right. the, winners that that doesn't really mean much like, so i guess maybe like, like krugman i think right nobel prize <laughs> right yeah <laughs> so maybe the distinction is is not uh you know we, we should stop name dropping that like ooh, f.a hayek is a right. nobel prize winning <laughs> anyway so he was a a, a famous guy nonetheless and uh so he wrote this book it's, it's very interesting so like all of our all of our books in the series are based off of an original text like miraculous pencil is based off of i pencil and uh, so we took the, the key ideas from that book and distilled it down into a story. And in our book, uh, Serfdom, we changed the E to a U. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So Serfdom is the name of a beach resort town called Serfdom. <laughs> and in the book, uh, the government there actually uses eminent domain to plow a road to Serfdom, a literal road to Serfdom. And in so doing, a lot of consequences unfold. And so the twins are kind of right in the middle of it. They're, they were used to going to this nearby town, but now the roads, the traffic pattern has all changed. The, the people are leaving uh, the old beach, going to serfdom. So all the beach shops are closing down because there's no people anymore. And so everyone's trying to move into serfdom. And the twins experience this. They observe it. Um, and then they, kind of, they have an a uncle reporter who, for those who know uh, Ben Swan, Ben mm. Ben is the uncle in the story. He's the, <laughs> the reporter. He's the uncle. So he helps the twins do this like investigative report. Um, and as they go around interviewing people to try and learn like, well, what happened to your farm? Oh, I'm in a domain. You know, they split it in half and I can't use it anymore. And um, why are you moving? Oh, because the traffic pattern changed. And now all these cars go through our neighborhood and we can't stand it. And so they, the twins see all of these um, consequences from central planning. And so they begin to understand why it's problematic. Their, their parents, their uncle and others kind of teach them some of the issues um, that Hayek introduces in his book that we've simplified down. Um, you know, what is, why is individualism important and free choices that you yourself make? It's not that there will never be consequences. You and I make decisions that affect other people, but those are voluntary decisions. They're consensual decisions. We are, of course, all impacted by others, but it's different when it's a you know government compulsion and central planning. So the book kind of teases out all of these different issues and then helps the kids understand those core ideas um, so that they can understand the primacy of the individual and why it's best to um, have choices that you're making as private parties rather than the government. Um, so it was a fun book. It, it's been doing really well. And, you know, a lot of people are familiar with The Road to Serfdom, the original book. And so like on Facebook and stuff, it's, it's really easy to kind of tag or find those people because they they really like and they're familiar with the original book. And so we then say, hey, we've got this children's version you can share with your you know grandkids or whatever. So so that one came out a, a couple of months ago and then we're coming up on, on our sixth book here pretty soon. Wow, it's awesome. Um, yeah, that, that's it, it, you know what brings to mind is um, is Walter Block's book, the um, the privatization of roads and highways, mm -hmm. and um, and you know how people, 
you know, that's one of the main arguments that people have a difficulty with when we talk about uh, the idea of a voluntary society and free markets and capitalism is <laughs> what about the roads, right? right. <laughs> you know, governments control the roads. I mean, governments don't actually build the roads. It's a big misnomer. They just like, t- you know, Contract force, it out. <laughs> forcefully redistribute money from productive people and give it to these people, you know, huge contracts and, and just, you know, no, no competition, it's just, you know, monopolistic entities. And, and, and that's one of the big reasons why it's so, so much in disrepair and, and, um, you know, potholes and just, just, um, you know, poor quality. Um, and so, you know, I, I can see, like, like you said, um, you know, it's just, it's so straightforward when somebody says, well, you know, this is a new town, like say this, say this town served them, right? Um, so we need to build a road. So why don't why doesn't the government do it? Like, what's wrong with that, right? And what's the difference between that and if a private company built a road? Like, isn't that the same thing? Why is there a I difference, remember, right? I, I remember uh, this was about two years ago, I think, year and a half ago. My wife texts me a photo. She was reading the Berenstain Bears to our children, and they have a they're a more Christian company. They mm. instill kind of moral religious type values not not necessarily explicitly religious but kind of that uh-huh. that framework that tone and uh but this one book was i mean i can't remember what it was about it was about uh, the mom in the bear family decided to run for mayor in her little bear town uh-huh. and the thing that set her off to running for mayor was there was a pothole in the road nearby and the government wouldn't come fix it. So she wanted to take power of the government so she could get that pothole fixed. <laughs> and it made me laugh because just a week ago I saw all these people sharing, including posting on my Facebook feed like, hey, check this out about anarchists. I, was I, I saw Port- that. Portland or yeah, Oregon yeah, 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 I saw that. <laughs> going out just fixing roads. I'm like, this is brilliant. You know, like they're taking the core argument who will right. build the roads, at least fix them, right? right and right. of course they're getting in trouble for going out of their way to, to solve the problem. But <laughs> I always tell people like if if we fixed everything else and all we have to worry about is how we'll build roads, like I'm done. I'm I'm pulling out of politics, like you know, I'm going to go live in Costa Rica on a hammock somewhere. <laughs> That's like a big success if we've solved everything except for roads. I don't tax me for roads, right? I don't care. I will I will be OK with a road tax if that's like we've everything else is a libertarian utopia. Everyone's like so obsessed with talking about this core idea. What's funny, not a lot of people know this. Let me share this really quick. It was uh, a year ago, actually. Um, April Fool's a year ago. Elijah and I i will have to send this to you. You can post it uh, with with the, the episode. Um, Elijah, the illustrator of our book series, and I thought up like, hey, let's do a fun little Tuttle Twins themed April Fools. And so he created a, a book cover image. And and like all of our other book covers, you know, it's got the twins and it's got some kind of background, you know, whatever the story is. And the title of the book was uh, the Tuttle Twins the Tuttle twins built the roads and they're in like a hard hat, you know, <laughs> uh-huh. a reflective vest and there's a road sign <laughs> behind them. And it was just this funny thing, right? Because like for us, it's always, Oh, who will build the roads? And the response was just overwhelmingly positive. Like you need to turn this into a book. This is amazing. You know, <laughs> this is like the libertarian kids book. And so I was like, well, like outside of our core libertarian audience, no one else would want to read a book about building roads. We got to make it more interesting. <laughs> right, and right. so that's when I thought of the idea of like, oh, well, uh, the road to surf them and we can kind of connect them that way. And mm-hmm. so it kind of morphed into that. But it all stemmed like the idea was prompted for the book from that April Fool's thing that we did because mm-hmm. we're so fascinated with this question of who will build roads. <laughs> you know, you, it was interesting the way you said, like, if everything was um, done away with except roads, you know, you'd be fine with that. Like, I, I, I tell people also, so that anarchists do not become anarchists because they see a pothole or because yeah. <laughs> or because of a state park or or because I don't know, you know, mundane things like that. Most people become anarchists because there are drone bombings happening, there are occupations, there's war, there's genocide. Like that's why people become anarchists. It's not right. because the road and yet people who argue against it, that's their primary argument. Exactly. <laughs> It's such a distraction. It's like, why are we even talking about this? Like, I will pay your road tax. Let's move on and talk about assassination attempts on American citizens. Okay. Like, can we please get on to something more important? 
<laughs> yeah, but but it also demonstrates a fundamental misunderstanding of economics and and voluntary trade and transactions and and just how and also about what the state is like. You know, like like I said before, they don't, they don't really see what's the difference if a state builds a road or if let's say a private um, a private company just builds a road. You know, with voluntary with voluntary transactions. You know, isn't that the same thing? But no, it's not because it wasn't stimulated by market demand that's a fundamental sure. difference right it right. was you know the, the state it just it has no way of no feedback mechanism no way of knowing where it's really needed they're kind of just poking in the dark and in, in guessing whereas um a private contractor who who has his own money on the line um has much more to lose <laughs> and, and would definitely make a much more careful choice well it, all, it also seems too like you're right and and i think building on that it all to me, it often seems like the Rhodes argument is like a gotcha somehow. Right. Like, but to me, it's 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 I don't know what the right term is. It's escapist. It's avoidance. Right. They're they're trying to avoid these substantive moral questions mm-hmm. that perhaps they recognize that they would lose on. That they have no compelling argument enough, and and rather than playing defense, they want to go on the offense. And I'm going to attack your anarchist because <laughs> look, I found this little you know if I you know erode your foundation, the whole thing will crumble. And so they they. <laughs> try and play offense, but they avoid, you know, talking about all the, the substance in between. It's, right. it's really silly. And I, I think it's great that our movement has almost turned this into a meme of sorts, <laughs> yeah. you know, that we can laugh it off and be like, okay, of course they're bringing this up because they can't, you know, defend their own argument anymore. Yeah. And before we go on to the next book, I just want to say um, another um, um, related argument that they give me is the donut problem, right? Which is like, if they, what if somebody buys a road and it encircles your house? Yeah. <laughs> like then, I would pay for that to happen yeah. just to like, see if someone would do it, you know, like, Oh man, it's just funny. These people, the, the things that they, or, or they say, what, what if, what if thousands of people would die and you would have to punch somebody in order for that to not happen, would you punt, Would you violate your principle? <laughs> you <know? laughs> so yeah, it's just ridiculous hypothetical rabbit holes. Me, nothing, and uh, not rooted in any principle, any logic, nothing. So yeah. Um, but on that note, on the NAP <laughs> violation, uh, there you why, go. Why Good we transition. Get, yeah. <laughs> why don't we talk about your your upcoming book, the uh, the Golden Rule? So uh, the way this book came about, I definitely wanted to do a a non-aggression principle related book. And that's been on the list for a while. The problem I had was there was no book I could really find that talked about NAP very well. Most most libertarian-ish books touch on it or incorporate it as some like subset of an overall argument or they'll, you know, talk about it in passing a little bit as they're kind of analyzing something else. But I really couldn't find any because each of our books is based on a book or an essay about that issue. And mm-hmm. so I was trying to find something like that talked about NAP. And I reached out to all sorts of you know libertarian scholars and folks trying to say, hey, is there some book out there that I haven't come across? Because I haven't really come across a NAP book. Um, a nap book. That sounds like a nursery, you know, like <laughs> yeah, it's put, na- your, it's, kid, it's put your kid to sleep. Right. <laughs> it's nap time, kids. <laughs> I should use that as a tagline. For I think the book. I think I think I have seen that as a meme or a T-shirt or something like that. I oh, that's, that's great! Yeah, like, it's it's nap time with the Tuttle Twins. And then also also I've seen that in relation to um, Judge Napolitano, Judge Nap, right? Oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I'm totally writing this down and use it. I got to figure out how to like put that in a marketing thing right, or something. Right. So um, so I couldn't find a book, and then I was, I was sitting in my library just looking through my books, and I realized that. Um, there's a book that was influential in my own uh, intellectual development that fit the case perfectly. And that book is by Ron Paul, and it's called A Foreign Policy of Freedom. This book is a compilation of speeches he's given in Congress over the decades on the issue of foreign policy. So each chapter is kind of broken down categorically and goes into different issues. Uh, But broadly speaking, it's all... NAP as it relates to international diplomacy and, and you know, between uh, nations and things like that. And there's so many nuggets in there where he expounds the principle. But here is the application of the principle. This is this is NAP on a world stage that Ron Paul for decades has been trying to espouse. Your listeners probably remember the South Carolina debate during the 2012 uh, election cycle when 
uh, Dr. Paul on stage as a presidential candidate suggested that we apply the golden rule to other nations. How would we like it if they came over and bombed us and treated us the way uh, we treat them? Hmm. And he was booed. Hmm. Like Whoa. this heavily Baptist, you know, Southern, uh, not a congregation, what would you call it? Audience, hmm. right? <laughs> uh, presumably a lot of them in there are Christian, right? Hmm. It's a very religious area that he was in at the time. Uh, for that debate, and here they are booing the application of the golden rule uh, hmm. to different countries. It was a very remarkable event that I've not forgotten at all and often referred to because it shows the hypocrisy of many Christians from a l religious perspective or conservatives from a political perspective. Hmm. So anyways, um, for me, that book was one of the first books I read uh, when I came across Ron Paul in 2007 and started learning more and kind of got, got pulled into the movement that way. And so I was like, okay, aha, here we have our book. It's all about the golden rule. It's all about the non-aggression principle. And so using that as like the book that we're basing it on, the story in, in our book, The Tuttle Twins and the Golden Rule, is based around summer camp. And so the twins go to summer camp and all the kids are split up into teams and there's competitions. So that immediately introduces factionalization, much like we have different countries competing hmm. for resources and conquest and so forth. And I don't want to give too much away, but hmm. if you read the book, it's very clear that the way we structured the story, the teams are kind of different countries, one hmm. more dominant, one more not submissive isn't the right word, but one more like, you know, being beat around like crazy. And mm -hmm. and then we talk about blowback. So we introduce kids to the concept of blowback, revenge, justice, mm -hmm. aggression, defense. Uh, but it's all couched in these these uh, kids are pranking one another and they're interfering with one another and they're, you know, tripping one and one falls down. And they're cheating and all sorts of stuff. And so obviously you can extrapolate that very broadly, not only to international type of stuff, but even just, you know, people interacting domestically as neighbors. Um, and so this is a powerful book. And one of the reasons that we're super excited for it is that the golden rule is a very soft topic. This isn't like you know, the Federal Reserve, like our third book, right? Like, <laughs> don't learn about, you know, <laughs> right. monetary policy and the gold the, standard. The, the, you know? That was one of my favorite books, right? Cause I, just because I love talking about gold and silver money and currency and all Absolutely. that. Absolutely. But, but that, that appeals to people who are like already right, there, right? Right, right. The nice sure. thing about the golden rule is this is going to appeal to a very broad audience right. who isn't already. And that's what we're trying to do with these yeah. books. We definitely want something for libertarians and anarchists and conservatives to you know give their kids and help mm -hmm. them learn. But we also want to grow the tent. If we're planting seeds, let's let's build, you know, mm -hmm. let's add more tent poles and let's build this thing over the next, you know, 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the golden rule is a very soft and appealing message. And so that's how we deliver it to parents, to the kids rather. And and then we kind of encumber that that message of the golden rule with kind of its related concepts of the non-aggression principle, which is almost like exactly the golden rule in a way and talk about blowback and talk about justice and talk about defense and, and things like that. So uh, we're super excited about this book because it's going to be a hook to easily get more people into the series and help them learning more because it's not like, hey, learn about these crazy libertarian ideas. It's, <laughs> oh, here, you can teach your child about the golden rule and this really fun story and what parent isn't going to want that. It's going to be very appealing. So we're really excited. And, and Ron Paul, um, is featured in, very prominently in the book, ah. uh, much like Ben Swan uh, was in our last one. Ron Paul is a prominent character in this book. Mm. Not by name. Uh, there's a, a Ron character, and it looks like him and, and <laughs> acts like him, but we don't say Ron, Ron Paul necessarily. But I sent the script to to end the illustrations. Once we had everything done, I sent it to Dr. Paul. I'm like, you know, hey, I just want to get your blessing on this, and you know, got the thumbs up, so we're excited. <laughs> Um, anyway, so that's the book. It's it's non-aggression principle. It's golden rule, um, and we're very excited about this one just because of the potential to reach new people and and really appeal. I mean, if NAP is like the core, the non-aggression principle is like the foundation of of what we believe. Um, to us, this is going to be like the missionary tool for for liberty with kids to you know be pushing this into the schools and getting a lot of people excited about it. So we're we're super excited. Yeah, and and what what it reminds me of is that. Parents intuitively, most parents intuitively understand and teach their kids about non-aggression, 
Like, don't hit other kids. Don't take their stuff. <laughs> Very simple right. things. And we all understand these things. Um, totally. But for some reason, when we when they think about the state, that's the giant exception to morality. So, um, yeah, so, so for that reason, like you said, it, it has the, the possibility or the capability to reach a, a huge audience, which is wonderful. And then, you know, you can, you can show them the other books in the series. That's right. Um, but yeah, so so that's that's kind of um that's something that I, I kinda tell people is that, you know, everybody really understands voluntarism. You know, maybe they don't understand the principles, the concepts, the names, but they do understand the philosophy. It's self evident, it's intuitive. That's what's so beautiful about it. <laughs> and and to your point a moment ago, just to add another word, intuitive, you know, and everything, I think the the right word or not not that yours are wrong. I think an additional word to define it is natural. Yeah. You just said yourself that parents teach it to kids. Like right. all, we all teach our kids the non-aggression principle. We all teach them mm. don't steal, don't hurt other people. Mm -hmm. That's that's natural. Mm. That's human. That's that's what we uh, that's what we do. You know, in nature with our offspring, we we want them to understand these these moral principles. But you're right. When it comes to the state, when it comes to voting, when it comes to you know, business even for some people, mm. you begin to encumber those laws uh, or rules with exceptions. Like, oh yeah, like that applies when it's you and and you know Susie at church or down the street. But but no, if it's government, just do whatever you want. Like you know, that's okay, <laughs> right? So it's it's uh, right. but it's so that's unnatural. That's mm. uh, you know, but it's definitely natural to espouse these these principles. I think. Yeah, I remember. Um... On the uh, we were talking on the Seeds of Liberty when I was on there on the podcast and and I mentioned the golden rule and then Dave Painter he said no actually it's better better uh, described as a silver rule right the golden rule is um you know do unto others what what you would have them do unto you and then the silver rule is do not do unto others what you would not have them do <laughs> because sure. because what if you're a masochist. <laughs> <laughs> and you enjoy pain <laughs> so it presents a problem <laughs> so. fortunately those are the exceptions and not yeah, the, the, right. the rule i think at least last time i checked that was culturally uh problematic right but. i thought that was funny but but yeah like you said you know this is um it's common law right where before it was sure. before monopolistic central um you know government law there was common law and and yeah there were basic property rights and you know, people understood these kind of um, these nor these social norms, uh, and and it, there weren't anything extraordinary or magical right. or strange. You know, everybody understood them, right? But now we have a uh, monopolistic um, man-made law, and uh, that kind of obscures the, the the waters with taxation and with regulation. Go ahead. To that point, I had someone email us a few weeks ago say, "I like the the sound of the the title of your new book, so I presume you're teaching kids that." He who owns the gold makes the rules, right? <laughs> like that's the sarcastic golden rule. And I'm like, well, in a way, you know, the state and the, you know, monopoly uh -huh. on money creation, uh -huh. and they're making the rules. So maybe that applies. You know, maybe we'll we'll leave it to the parents to extrapolate <laughs> that and and teach their kids that aspect to it. But I, I just got a good laugh out of that. He who makes the gold. Okay. Um, he who owns, say, who, the gold who owns the gold makes the rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm, okay. <laughs> Although I guess the, I guess it doesn't work because we don't know that Fort Knox actually has any gold anymore, right? So maybe America. He who owns the printing press. Uh, makes, right. Makes, right. Yeah. Definitely. That, that's definitely <laughs> true. The 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 importance of having a central bank in a in a in a nation state really. Um, it's like the lifeblood of an economy is its currency is its money mm -hmm. and once you have control monopolistic control over that you know it's so easy to extract whatever wealth you want you know just print we'll out. have to we'll have to do uh, the tuttle twins and the cryptocurrency or, oh, you sure. know, the, the deep web or the <laughs> <laughs> i don't know you know like how do you decentralize the beast and, and right i don't know it's it's fun like so we've we've got We've got our seventh book planned. I haven't uh, announced what it is quite yet, but uh, we're trying to figure out what eight, nine, and ten will be. So I kind of joke like that, like, oh, maybe we should do a book. But I'm still trying to figure out, like, okay, what are we actually going to do? Like, mm. what what aspects of, of you know, the liberty uh, philosophy have we not covered, right? We've got Bastiat's The Law. We've got Eye Pencil. We've got Money with the creature from Jekyll Island. We've got 
competition and business and capitalism and central planning and now we've got non-aggression principles. So I've got like a list going that I, you know, potential ideas. So, I mean, you or your what? listeners or anyone else, we definitely welcome ideas because we're always trying to figure out like if we're only doing 10, we don't want to do 10 and be like, oh, crap, we missed that, you know, important one that we want to do. So we're trying to make sure we plan it pretty well. Have you covered the concept of the tragedy of the commons? Not really. No. Or, and, and Go ahead. Or the broken window fallacy. Um, so that one is potentially on our list. Definitely. Cool. Um, one thought I had is maybe we don't want to do two Bastiat things where we've already done the law oh. and you well, know well, he. Ex- well, well, I mean, when I think of the first one, I think of legal plunder specifically. That that book right talks more on legal plunder, like taxation mm-hmm. you know, and what's the difference with that and theft and all that. Yeah. So yeah. So so tragedy of the commons. I mean, it's just, it just focuses on the the economics of you know having a monopoly based, based as a, as a compared to competition, right? right? And a broken window fallacy is just another way of looking at taxation as just being. The redistribution of wealth, you know, forcefully, and how, how yeah. you know, the destruction of wealth as as opposed as opposed to the creation of wealth. So, well, and and another thing too that we're trying to be sensitive to is not being too heavy politically or too heavy economically, mm, right? Okay. We also want to have ethics and you know social values and things like that that are kind of in the broad ecosystem that all blend together it, mm. we don't want a, a 10-part series on austrian economics for kids <laughs> like we, we right, want right. a very like well-rounded thing right. you know and, and so like golden rule right that's more social ethical right uh, certainly it's also political it's also economic but it's not primarily so so we're trying to figure that out still i mean we've got time we um you know we'll probably be done in a couple years like i would imagine with the 10th book but I'll tell you this, we're having a ton of fun. I mean, the, I got a, I got a picture the other day. Um, I think I'm going to post this on Facebook uh, in the next few days of uh, a, a guy's son. He gave him the, the pencil book, the miraculous pencil. And in there, the, the twins learn about the the pedigree the uh, of the, the pencil, right? That it's wood and lead right, and right. the metal and rubber and so forth. And so in the book, the, they kind of draw out the, you know, all the nodes of the, you yeah. know, tree and and everything. And so his son went up to the whiteboard and just started creating something like that, but taking it way deeper than we do in the book, you know, and, and who's connected to this and, and who's involved in this and what's required here. And he has this whiteboard full of just these nodes all interconnected. It was amazing. The kid looked like he was maybe, I don't know, eight. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. he said his son just kind of went to town and yeah. it was amazing. So <laughs> it's, it's so fun to see, because for me, it's like, who who's the next Ron Paul out there or whoever, you know, your um, admire, not your admire, you know, whoever your idol is, right, the Liberty right. Movement, right? like pick that person. Who's who, where are they that if we don't reach them now, maybe it won't be until they're 65 years old that someone else would would, would reach them. Right. Mm-hmm. Like the seeds that we're planting now for us are so exciting to think about what those can germinate into over the years if we're reaching all these kids now, giving them that foundation, helping them understand these ideas mm. from an early age. It's exciting. And it's 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 also interesting because we can't like quantify it. We can't force it. Like we have no idea. We're just casting this net out there, seeing what we catch. But for us, there's so much satisfaction that the reviews we get from parents about like, oh my gosh, this totally made sense for my kid. Thank you. That was amazing. And mm. uh, it's that's super rewarding. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. And before we wrap up, I just want to say um, about the spontaneous order um, idea. It just reminded me of Trump and his his desire to you know erect this wall and cut off trade relations with this country and how harmful. Nick talking about um, uh, unintended consequences. You know how how that can just send repercussions throughout the economy and harm so many people, raise prices and just cut off supply lines of. You know, cheaper goods that most a lot of people benefit from. So, absolutely. Know, so, uh, yeah. So, I, I, it's really um, something. Uh, basic concepts that are valuable and important to uh, to share. So, we um, always say we always say that our books are designed for children, but they're also made for politicians. It's at their <laughs> level of of comprehension. So, if anyone wants to get Donald Trump, you know, our Total <laughs> Twin series, we will donate a set. <laughs> If you can place it with, you know, the White House and get him to read it, he can understand it. It's like uh, the Christians will will remember when he said his favorite uh, book was 2 Corinthians uh-huh. rather than 2 Corinthians. So maybe he's reading at a very low level. Maybe he can <laughs> he, he can understand uh, the Tuttle Twins, too. So we will gift a copy. Standing <laughs> offer. Any listeners out there who can get this to the heavily guarded Trump Tower 
<laughs> let let me know and we will we will we will deliver them. You know who you got to reach to do that? You got to reach the guy who gives him his Mexican rice bowl in the morning. That's the guy oh. they got to reach to put it right next to spontaneous order book right next here, Mr. Trump. Just take a look. Let's <laughs> do it. <laughs> uh, but uh, awesome conversation, Connor. Really appreciate you coming on. Um, so, so just re- reiterate how people can reach you if they want to follow and find your find your books. Yeah, thanks. So uh, me personally, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and and Twitter. You can just search Connor Boyack and you'll find me. And um, for Tuttle Twins, the easiest place is TuttleTwins.com. We've got a great combo pack offer where we give out all the uh, workbooks for free and and other uh, incentives and discounts. So that's at TuttleTwins.com. We also have a Facebook page and and Twitter and everything for that as well. I'm pretty easy to find online. So any of your listeners interested, feel free to follow. Uh, We'd love that. And we'll keep trying to grow the movement over the long term. Excellent. I love it. I love the uh, the creation <clears throat> and the sharing of knowledge. So, yeah, everyone, please check his books out, buy his books. You know, he's doing some awesome work, him and uh, Elijah. Give him some support, some love. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can help me out through Bitcoin, Patreon, or PayPal. Links are below, patreon.com slash peacefinancism to help me out. Uh, dollar show is all I ask. If you find value in my work, trade value for value. is the capitalist way, and you would encourage me to interview more fascinating people like Connor here. So uh, thanks a lot, Connor. Really appreciate it. So this is Thank Peace, you. Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Purchase Network <clears throat> and theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. <clears throat> Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you will receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.